100 years ago exactly, Howard Zinn was born in New York. A shipyard worker, World War II bombardier, playwright, academic and historian, Zinn took part in workplace organising, the civil rights movement, the movement against the Vietnam War and countless other campaigns. He was spied on by the FBI and authorities around the world tried to ban his books, which have inspired a generation of others to take up the task of researching and promoting history from below, including us. This is Working Class History. A la mattina, appena alzata, oh bella ciao, bella ciao. Bella ciao, ciao, ciao alla mattina. Before we get started, just a quick reminder that our podcast is brought to you by our Patreon supporters. Our supporters fund our work and in return get exclusive early access to podcast episodes, bonus episodes, free and discounted merchandise and other content. For example, our Patreon supporters can listen to both parts of this double episode now. Join us or find out more at patreon.com slash workingclasshistory. Link in the show notes. Howard Zinn was without doubt one of the most influential US historians of the last century. Particularly his work, A People's History of the United States, first published in 1980 and since expanded and republished multiple times. A US bestseller which has sold over 2 million copies and been translated into multiple languages. The New York Times, in Howard's obituary, declared that the book, quote, inspired a generation of high school and college students to rethink American history, end quote. We at WCH are some of the many people who were inspired by his work. In fact, we almost named our project People's History in a deliberate homage to Zinn's book, but in the end decided against it because we thought we should stress the importance of class, although our project would probably be more popular if we had. So on the centenary of his birth, as part of numerous Zinn at 100 events around the world, we wanted to make a podcast about his life and ideas in his own words. I grew up in a working class family, a um, struggling family. My father was a waiter. He met my mother when they were both immigrant factory workers in New York. And, and uh, I grew up in tenements and miserable places. <laughs> and uh, one step ahead of the landlord in the, the Depression years. This is Howard Zinn talking to Sasha Lilly in what turned out to be one of the last, if not the last, interview before his sudden death in January 2010. This was a video interview which appears on the DVD Theory and Practice, Conversations with Noam Chomsky and Howard Zinn, available on the link in the show notes. We are grateful to Sasha and PM Press for their permission to use audio from this interview in these episodes. Howard grew up in New York City, the son of Jewish immigrant parents from Siberia and what was then Austria-Hungary. His parents met one another one day, working in the same factory. No, home was not a nice place to be. Uh, I remember the first time I walked into somebody's home who had a piano and and house looked clean and neat. <laughs> I thought, wow, <laughs> this is very nice. I'd never saw anything like this. No, uh, home was no place to be. It crowded and messy, and and so we lived out on the street. Really, I mean, that's you know, in poor neighborhoods, that's what you have. You have street life. Kids are out on the street. That's where they have their fun. That's where they meet their friends, and uh, that's why when you walk out here in the suburbs and. In middle-class neighborhoods, you don't see anybody on the street. They have nice homes. Uh, so, yeah, I, yeah, I suppose that. You, growing up in the Depression years, seeing people having a hard, hard time, seeing people evicted from their homes. Uh, I, I, mean, I have a vivid memory of uh, seeing furniture piled up on the sidewalk outside of this family home and the crowd gathering and and then the crowd facing off the police and moving the furniture back into the house a very dramatic uh, conflict and uh, but this was a this was a kind of scene that uh, that I, I th- you don't forget uh, so you might say I was class conscious at an early age, uh, without ever hearing the word class. 
Class consciousness basically means an understanding of your position as part of an economic class in society. So, in Howard's case, this was the working class. His dad at this time worked jobs like digging ditches and cleaning windows, and later became a waiter and joined the waiters' union. And uh, at the age of 18, I, instead of going to college, I went into work in a shipyard, in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And uh, the kids in my neighborhood never went to college. They, they graduated from high school, or they dropped out of high school, and they went to work. Families needed the money, and families couldn't afford to send them to college, even though it was a free college, even though it was city college, you know. No, they needed their kids' little salaries. And so I went to work in the Brooklyn Navy Yard for fourteen forty a week <laughs> and, uh, and worked there for three years. But in the meantime, uh, I had become you know, politically interested, involved, radicalized. I think by encountering young radicals on my street and communists and members of the Young Communist League, and, and they were very political and very smart. <laughs> I, I was impressed by how much they knew. And I was interested in these things, but I didn't know as much as they did. I, I was reading books. Yeah, I read at an early age. I, th I think this is one of the important influences in my life, just starting to read at an early age, starting to read Dickens and Mark Twain when I was 13 or 14. You know, my parents didn't know about books. Uh, there was no book in the house, not a single book in the house. No movie magazines, my mother read. <laughs> but no, no books. But I picked up books on the street, you know, and read. Uh, and uh, so I was interested. I was reading about fascism and socialism and 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 so, I, yes, by the time I went to the Navy Yard to work, I was already a political person. Well, in fact, just before that, I had been in a demonstration in Times Square, which my, which my communist friends took me to, my first demonstration. And uh, uh, it was exciting. I didn't know what a demonstration was. I thought going to Times Square would be fun. <laughs> and, and so there were all these... People milling around in Times Square, and at a certain moment, they unfurled banners. And to this day, I don't even know what the banners said. Probably, stop fascism, stop war, something like that. It sounded okay to me. And uh, and then I heard sirens, and uh, I thought there must be a fire somewhere. <laughs> no, of course not. The police attacking the crowd, and th this was. You know, important revelation to me. My God, police attacking these people, they're not doing anything, just marching and holding placards. Before I knew it, I was spun around, knocked on the head. <laughs> knocked unconscious, actually. Woke up in a doorway. Who knows when? An hour later? Times Square was as it had been before. Nobody quiet, no demonstration. No, it was weird, eerie, eerie, uh, but it, it was a radicalizing moment for me. I thought, wow, my, these guys, these radicals, uh, they're right. <laughs> you know, the state is not neutral. The police are not neutral. Uh, there is no real free speech in America, not if you, you know, antagonize the establishment. Anyway, so uh, I guess what I'm saying is that even before I went to work in a shipyard at the age of 18. I was already politicized in a certain way. And then in the shipyard in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, I encountered three other young fellows who were also young radicals, and the four of us set out to organize the young workers in the shipyard. And um, we did, we formed, because we were excluded from the union. The union was an AFL union, craft union. They only took in skilled workers, which meant, <laughs> that they were excluding blacks because the black workers in the, in the Navy Yard were the unskilled workers, but the heaviest work, riveters and shippers and, you know, nasty work. So the, uh, the young apprentices were outside the union. We organized them and 
This was quite typical behaviour of AFL unions at the time, which were often strictly segregated on the basis of race and gender. But even if they weren't, they could be de facto segregated by only permitting membership for workers in certain so-called, quote, skilled craft jobs and refusing entry to anyone in so-called unskilled jobs, which, as in this case, often effectively meant black workers. And meanwhile, the, the war in Europe was going on. And soon the United States was in the war. And then my friends outside of the Navy Yard were going into the military. And uh, because if you were in the Navy Yard, you didn't have to go in the military. You were doing important war work, you know, building ships. I worked on the USS Iowa and the USS Missouri. And Missouri was later became famous because that's where the Japanese surrender was signed. And, so on, yeah, so we were doing important work, but I didn't want to stay in the Navy Yard. I wanted to get into the fray. I, fascism, I almost said fascism beckoned. <laughs> no, <laughs> but the war against fascism beckoned. And uh, and some of my friends were already in the military. And so, yeah, so I enlisted in the Air Force. Over the course of the war, Howard's views on the conflict changed dramatically. I entered the war, entered the Air Force as an enthusiastic bombardier. That's why I became a bombardier on a heavy bomber stationed in England and flying missions uh, over Germany and Hungary and Czechoslovakia and even France. And, uh, and uh, it was a good war. That's why I enlisted. War against fascism. Uh, it was very clear they were the bad guys. We were the good guys. But I began to have doubts, small doubts. Doubts first put into my head by a guy who was on another crew. A young fellow who was, he was a gunner on another crew. And we became friends. I guess we became friends because we were both readers. There weren't too many readers in the Air Force. <laughs> and uh, and so we, we exchanged books and ideas and talked. And... And once he said to me, he said, you know, we are fighting in an imperialist war. I was startled. I was, what do you mean? He said, both sides are imperialist. Fascists are terrible. Now what about our side? You know, the British Empire, <laughs> the French Empire, the Dutch Empire, the American Empire, Soviet Union, Stalin. Well, you know, what makes us think we're the good guys? Uh, no, they're both sides are fighting for imperial interests. It was shocking to me to hear that. I was so totally imbued with the idea we're on the right side. I mean, to this day, of course, I understand how soldiers make a decision at the beginning. I'm on the right side. Once you make that decision, you don't have to think anymore. You don't have to examine what you do from that point on. Everything you do is right. You can kill. You can drop bombs on Hiroshima. And I, you've, you're on the right side. So I, uh, yeah, I, uh, I listened to this guy and, and I said, well, if that, you believe that, why are you here? He said, well, I'm here to talk to guys like you. <laughs> <laughs> this startled me, too, the idea that, wow, this guy's risking his life, you know, to be, you might say, to embed himself in the military and to speak out against the war in which he's risking his life. Uh, ironically, oh, tragically, this guy didn't return from a mission some weeks later. You know, amazing. He gave me a book called The Yogi and the Commissar by Arthur Kessler. Now, a book that's not well known these days. Arthur Kessler was a Hungarian Jewish author who was a member of the Communist Party, spent time in the Soviet Union, and was sent by the party to Spain during the Civil War, which we talk about in our episodes 39 and 40. There, he spied on the nationalist and fascist forces of General Francisco Franco until he was arrested in 1937, although he was later released in a prisoner swap. He later left the Communist Party and became a critic of totalitarianism. The author, yeah, he was in The God That Failed. and So a lot of people know that, but they don't know the yogi and the commissar. But Kessler had fought in Spain. He had the credentials of a 
of a left winger so I could listen to him. And he was anti-Soviet, critical of the Soviet Union. And, and uh, the yogi and the commissar, and he was... Um, so uh, it started me, I think, on the road to examining the war I was in. But I didn't do that until after the war. After the war, I uh, picked up John Hersey's book on Hiroshima. And I had seen the headlines of the bombing of Hiroshima when I had flown from Europe back to the United States with my crew. And we were having a 30-day furlough before going on to the Pacific. And we were going to continue bombing missions in the Pacific. And I'd, I'd been married just before I went overseas, and, and my wife and I were going to spend this 30-day furlough out in the country and stopped at a bus stop. And there was this newspaper with this headline, Atomic Bomb Dropped on Hiroshima. Uh, we were glad. Uh, oh, wow, this is great. What's the atomic bomb? We didn't know. Just another bomb. I had been dropping bombs. Maybe this is a bigger bomb, but it sounds like this might end the war, so this is good, you know. That was my attitude at the moment. And then I read John Hersey's book about Hiroshima, and then it came home to me what that was. You know, he interviewed the survivors in Hiroshima, and you can imagine what the survivors looked like. Uh, the people without eyes, without faces, without legs, without arms, I mean. Now, going into detail about the rights and wrongs of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki is beyond the scope of this episode. But in brief, apologists for what happened nowadays typically say that while it might have been sad, it was better than the alternative, which was a US land invasion of Japan, which would have cost more lives. This is false, however, as the positing of the bombing as an alternative to land invasion was only come up with in 1947, well after the war ended. At the time, numerous senior US military and government officials admitted that the bombing served no practical purpose in the war effort. For example, Admiral William D. Leahy, former chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, said, quote, It is my opinion that the use of this barbarous weapon at Hiroshima and Nagasaki was of no material assistance in our war against Japan. The Japanese were already defeated and ready to surrender. My own feeling was that in being the first to use it, we had adopted an ethical standard common to the barbarians of the Dark Ages. I was taught not to make war in that fashion, and wars cannot be won by destroying women and children. We'll put more reading on this point in the sources on the webpage for this episode. Anyway, reading Hershey's book really made Howard reconsider what he'd been part of. The reality of bombing suddenly came home to me and I was horrified because I had been bombing. I had never seen anybody down below. I didn't know what was happening to people uh, under my bombs. Because you fly from 30,000 feet high, you don't see any human beings. It's, it's a mechanical, distant operation, which is what so much of modern warfare is like. People killing at a distance, people killing non-human objects, you know, and and. So I, I, I began to think about that, and then, and then began to think about Dresden and, you know, and, and the bombing we had done in Europe. It wasn't until actually years later that I learned about the bombing of Tokyo. I think to this day most Americans do not know that several months before Hiroshima, we firebombed Tokyo and killed 100,000 people in one night. So all these, all all of these uh, experiences made me reconsider the idea of the good war. Is there such a thing as a good war? If World War II, which was the best of wars, the most clear-cut moral war, fascism, and so on, if the, this, the most clear-cut moral war, uh, needed to be examined, then. Surely all the other wars. And uh, so, I, yes, I, that experience turned me uh, against war, period. Indeed, you can see what Howard's view ultimately was of World War II in A People's History of the United States. And while some of the crimes of the Nazis were unique to them, 
particularly the industrialised and systematic genocide of Jewish, Roma, Sinti and disabled people and so on. As we discuss in our episodes 35 to 37, these crimes had nothing to do with Allied participation in the war. And as Howard references, the Allies were hardly the beacons of racial equality and democracy which is often pretended today. For example, the British Empire was responsible for the deaths of millions of people in the Bengal famine during the war. And not long afterwards, Britain was happy to herd hundreds of thousands of people into concentration camps in its colonies in Kenya and Malaysia. Belgium killed half the population of the Congo. France brutalised the population of Algeria. The list goes on and on. After the war, Howard had to return to normal life. After I came back from the Air Force and my wife and I lived in a little rat-infested <laughs> apartment in, in Brooklyn. Um, I, I hope, you know, people in Brooklyn won't take offense at this. <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, there are rat-infested apartments in every big city. This happened to be in Brooklyn. <laughs> and uh, it's interesting how you leave the military and you go back to your life before and if your life before was in a working class, even though you've been in the military and you've been an officer and you've worn good uniforms and eaten good food, and, yeah, you're, an, as they say, an officer and a gentleman. And then the war ends and you're back in the working class, working at odd jobs, which is what I was doing. You know, I went back to the Navy Yard for a while, didn't like it, worked as a ditch digger, worked as a waiter, worked as this, worked as that, you know. And that was my life, my back to my working class life. Decided to go to college under the GI Bill. And, uh, and yeah, so I, I went to college under the GI Bill. I went to college in the daytime and worked four to 12 shift in a warehouse loading trucks because while the GI Bill was wonderful and generous, you might say, it wasn't, still wasn't enough to keep you alive. So I had to work and my wife had to, work and now we had two little kids and they were in a nursery and so on. So um, I um, went to Columbia Graduate School, got a PhD at Columbia, and, and then my first teaching job was at Spelman College in Atlanta. And the next seven years were in the South and uh, living in the black community of, of Atlanta, 1956 to 1963. Spelman College was a historically black women's college, and Howard was recruited as chair of the history department. At that time, civil rights struggles were raging, which would have a profound influence on Howard. I was just looking for a job. I wasn't. I was, I was looking for teaching a black college, you know. And no, I, I was just looking for a job, and this job came along. So we packed up our old Chevy and went down, and. Uh, and that was a, probably the most educational experience of my life. Uh, uh, being in the South in those particular years, you know, went down in 56, which was a year after the Montgomery bus boycott, and stayed until 63. And the Montgomery bus boycott was a really pivotal direct action campaign, which began after the refusal of various black women and activists like Claudette Colvin and Rosa Parks to vacate seats on segregated buses to white passengers. After 13 months, it resulted in the desegregation of public transport in the city in Alabama. And could see the development of the movement uh, you know, and became involved, became involved with my students. Uh, even before the sit-ins, uh, we were making little forays, the students, I, little forays into Atlanta to, uh, against sort of symbols of racial segregation. And, uh, you know, and it was uh, instructive. Uh, we were uh, instructive in showing, actually, that you could win little victories if, you know, you stuck at it. And, you know, for my students decided they wanted to desegregate the Atlanta Public Library. Uh, libraries were segregated, like schools were segregated. And the main library in Atlanta, called the Carnegie Library, was only for whites. They decided they're going to try to get in. <laughs> and uh, they would go to the library and ask for books. 
He said, we, we don't have these books in the Black Library. <laughs> uh, we, we'd like uh, John Locke, an essay on human understanding. <laughs> we, we like just John Stuart Mill on liberty. You know, we like, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the librarians are getting more and more embarrassed. Librarians are sensitive people. <laughs> I suppose that's why they become librarians, right? Librarians, you know, they they're, they're not going to get angry and say, get out of here. They find all sorts of excuses, you know. Um, but the, this campaign went on and on, and finally they broke down. And, uh, and they desegregated the, the library, which was, you know, a victory, amazing victory that just a handful of students had succeeded in doing. That was a, a lesson. With his students setting an example, Howard soon got involved in organizing himself. And I became involved with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and, which was formed in 1960. And, and uh, the sit-ins had taken place in, starting in February in Greensboro, North Carolina. And, and, and sit-ins spread to two other cities in the South, spread to Atlanta the next month. And my students, my Spelman College students, very polite, very <laughs> controlled. Spelman College was like a, a nunnery. Well, you know, the students, yeah, it was, yeah. <laughs> so they had to go to chapel six times, six mornings a week, compulsory chapel. Yeah, they couldn't double date <laughs> until, you know, the, <laughs> they, you know, it was, it was a very controlled place. And the idea was to take these, uh, young black girls from the South and move them into the middle class, teach them manners, really, like finishing school, teach them how to pour tea, wear white gloves, really, amazing. And uh, what happened is when they got involved in the movement, and they broke out of Spelman College and went into the city where they had Never really gone because the city was a forbidding place. It was tightly, Atlanta was as tightly segregated as Johannesburg, South Africa. And, uh, but they went into the city and they sat in and they got arrested. And when they came back to the campus, they were on fire and rebelled against the administration, against the rules and regulations. It was, uh, fascinating to see the change from passivity and courtesy and deportment and from that to uh, rebellion and anger. And so, yeah, I, I became involved with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which had formed out of the various sit-ins that had taken place throughout the South. And, and the SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, asked me to be on their executive board uh, along with one other person they considered an adult. It, we were the two adult advisors, I and a woman named Della Baker, a black woman, a very sure. remarkable woman with a history of organizing in Harlem and with the NAACP and very wise. And, uh, so, yeah, I um, became, a, I guess, a kind of a writer and participant in the movement, doing both at the same time. Like going around from Atlanta, Georgia, to Albany, Georgia, where demonstrations were taking place, to Selma, Alabama, to various towns in Mississippi, Hattiesburg, and Greenville, and Greenwood, and Jackson. And, and uh, yeah, writing about this and, and participating in it. And, um, and as I said, it was uh, an educational experience for me. Howard quite casually name drops Ella Baker here. I'm sure many of our listeners will be aware of her, but in case you're not, she was a legendary civil rights activist. Born in 1903, her grandmother had been enslaved, but Baker went on to play key roles in the National Association for the Advancement of Coloured People, NAACP, Martin Luther King Jr.'s Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and the SNCC. The SNCC archive website explains that, quote, there would not have been a SNCC without Ella Baker, end quote and it explains that she'd organised the founding conference of the group. Baker was a firm believer in participatory democracy and rank-and-file control of struggle, saying that, quote, strong people don't need strong leaders, end quote. 
This sometimes led her into conflict with male leaders in the civil rights movement. She remained active until her death in 1986. Going back to Howard Zinn, in 1963 he was fired by the college for insubordination, although he said that in the academic world, you don't say fired. We actually, we rarely say dismissed. <laughs> we say, what do we say? We say, oh, this contract was not renewed. <laughs> but yes, I was fired. <laughs> Let's put it bluntly. People often think that it's impossible to fire tenured professors, but in reality, that's not the case. I was chair of the department. Well, when you ask, how is that possible when you have tenure? It's like asking, how can a policeman hit you with a club when we have a constitution? <laughs> the law is one thing, power is another thing. And when I began teaching at Boston University, I taught a course called Law and Justice in America. And that was the theme of the course. This is law and this is justice. This is the law and this is power. And a uh, very important thing to learn. So, yeah, uh, I was fired despite the fact that I had tenure and was chair of the department and was a full professor. And, uh, and I, was, I was fired and they didn't send me my letter until June. They wanted to wait until all the students were off the campus and uh, everything was quiet. And that's when the ax came down. And so uh, my family and I picked up our belongings and went north. And, oh, well, I, there was a sort of consolation prize that went along with the letters telling me goodbye. Uh, there was a, said, well, we'll give you one year's salary, $7,000, <laughs> so we could live for the next year on $7,000, which we did, <laughs> actually. We moved up to Boston and had a year in which I did some writing and kept going back to the South and so on. In his enforced sabbatical, Howard began to also get involved in organizing against the Vietnam War. We talk a lot more about this movement in our episodes 43 to 46, and about its origins in the civil rights movement. Becoming involved in the war, uh, well, seemed natural. And, uh, and here I was coming up north in 63, 64, there's a Gulf of Tonkin incident, which is the precipitating incident that brings the escalation of the war. Uh, but as I said, I was still going down. My wife and I spent the summer of 64 in Mississippi, Freedom Summer, where people came from all over the country to work on, on uh, the right to vote for black people and set up freedom schools for kids and did all sorts of things. And, and that was the summer in which that infamous incident took place with the murder of three civil rights workers, uh, one black, two whites, Cheney, Schwerner, and Goodman. That took place in, in June. At least they disappeared in June. Their bodies weren't found until uh, late July, uh, beginning of August. Yeah, because we had, at the beginning of August, we had a, a memorial ceremony for them in Philadelphia, Mississippi, which is where they had been arrested and from which they were dragged out and executed. And people came, people in the movement, in the civil rights movement, came from various parts of Mississippi to this memorial meeting. It was held out of doors. It was a, actually a beautiful day. And, and Mrs. Cheney, the mother of, of, of James Cheney, one of the guys who was killed, was there. And Bob Moses, who was the organizer, it's the SNCC organizer in Mississippi, a sort of a fabled organizer. And um, they're quiet, um, but very courageous. And, and uh, uh, he uh, got up on the platform at the memorial meeting, and he held up a newspaper. And it was that morning's... Jackson, Mississippi newspaper, and the headline said, LBJ says, shoot to kill in the Gulf of Tonkin. Hmm. <laughs> and, and 
he said, so, ready to shoot to kill in the Gulf of Tonkin, half a world away. And the federal government will not send anybody down here to Mississippi to protect civil rights workers, three of whom have just been killed. It was a very dramatic moment. It's, and it was, you might say it was a, the beginning in a certain sense of the anti-war movement, the uh, uh, convergence of the two movements. And in fact, you know, the anti-war movement drew a lot from the civil rights movement, drew a lot of the, the spirit and feeling and, and hostility to the national government. Uh, and, and, and people who were in the civil rights movement became involved in the anti-war movement. And uh, so, uh, you know, I, I was there that that day, and and uh, and um, became involved after, you know, uh, in what became a slowly growing movement against the war. In, in the spring of '65, which is a, a moment of important escalation in the war, we had a rally on the Boston Common. Uh, against the war, and um, I spoke, and Herbert Marcuse, a political philosopher, spoke. A uh, hundred people <laughs> was in a very big, big turnout, and I, I, I tell people about that when they when they complain that oh man, you know, we're not having a big demonstration. Look how many people showed up. People get this consulate and so on. But yeah, a hundred people. But then it grew, it grew and grew. Yeah, three and a half years later, another meeting on the Boston Common, and a hundred thousand people were there. So, uh, so yeah, I became involved in. I just began. Now I was teaching at Boston University. I was offered a job when I came that year that I was uh, living. Luxuriously, on our seven thousand uh, dollars, I was invited to teach at Boston University, and, and so I was teaching at Boston University, and at the same time, very active in, in the anti-war movement. Um, and therefore, it wasn't easy for me to get tenure at Boston University because of that. It was a very tricky thing, uh, but ultimately, I did. Um, Although that's a story in itself, but I, I won't go into it. <laughs> One of those academic stories, you know. You know how boring academic stories are. <laughs> <laughs> That brings us to the end of part one of this double podcast episode about the life and work of Howard Zinn. Our Patreon supporters can listen to part two now. For everyone else, it will be out in the next couple of weeks. We're only able to make this podcast because of support from you, our listeners on Patreon. So if you can, please consider joining us for as little as $2 a month at patreon.com slash workingclasshistory. Link in the show notes. Supporters get great benefits like early access to episodes, as well as exclusive bonus episodes, free and discounted books and merch, and more. If you can't right now, don't worry about it, but please do spread the word about our podcast, share links to episodes on your social media, and take a second to give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. This podcast is part of a number of events for Howard Zinn's centenary. Links to more of them in the show notes. You can also get hold of Zinn's book, A People's History of the United States, and all the books in Beacon Press's People's History of the US series on the link in the show notes. If you're enjoying this interview, you can also watch the full thing on video on the DVD available from PM Press. Link in the show notes. As a listener to the podcast, you can also get 10% off the cost of this or anything else in our online store using the discount code WCHPODCAST. As always, we've got sources, links to more info, transcripts and more on the webpage for this episode. Link in the show notes. Thanks again to our Patreon supporters for making this podcast possible. Special thanks to Stone Lawson. Our theme tune is Bella Chow. Thanks for permission to use it from Disky del Sole. You can buy it or stream it on the links in the show notes. This episode was edited by Jesse French.
Thanks to all of you for listening. Catch you next time. Libertad, muerto por la libertad.